be here with you for this special episode that we're recording at the Karsh Institute's three-day forum called Democracy 360. Let's dive right in, shall we, Siva? Today we are talking women, feminism, and history, pretty much my favorite topics. And we're talking about media, film and print to be exact. So to help us pull all these strands together, we have invited two outstanding thinkers to join us on the stage today. Indeed, we are delighted to be here with Jennifer Weiss-Wolf, a legal expert and the author of the groundbreaking book, Periods Gone Public, Taking a Stand for Menstrual Equity. Jen is also a contributor to Ms. Magazine and its executive director of strategy and partnerships. She'll have a lot to share with us about a new volume celebrating the publication's 50 year anniversary and its role in shaping the feminist movement in the United States. We also have with us our dear friend and colleague, Sumat, I'm sorry, Samhita Sunya. Let me do it again. We also, oh, we also have with us our dear friend and colleague, Samhita Sunya, a cinema professor at UVA. Samhita studies Hindi film and song in particular. She teaches and writes about their circulation across South Asia and beyond, and especially how gender has been represented in Indian film. She's the author of the 2022 book, Sirens of Modernity, World Cinema via Bombay. Samhita, Jen, a warm welcome to both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for hosting us. We're so glad to be here. Oh. Yeah, thank you. So glad this is part of the, the weekend's program, too. Yeah, mm -hmm. our, our mm -hmm. pleasure. Yeah. Well, Jen, I, I, I'm going to start with you with a question that takes us back to the very first issue of Ms. Hang on. We're about to actually have a thing up on the screen, so that's why. That's fine. There we go. I did this cue. Oh, there it is. Hey. There right. she is. We've got a picture of it up here behind us. Let me describe it for our listeners who can't see what's in the what's in the screen here. It shows the figure of the Hindu goddess Kali. Samita, I'm sure you'll have a few things to say about this in a moment. Uh, this this figure has, of course, many arms. She's doing many different chores all at once: typing, ironing, cleaning, driving, cooking. And the headline above it says, The Housewife's Moment of Truth. So tell us about the genesis of this issue, Jen. It's January 1972. What's going on in the country? What was going on in the feminist movement? And what was Ms., with this cover in particular, stepping in to say? Okay, we're gonna take it back 50 years. Um, I mean, me, for me personally, I was five, um, and I, I actually wouldn't discover Ms. To for probably about another decade more. I found it as a teenager in my public library, and I always actually love to talk to folks about where and how they might have found Ms. in their lives. But if we could take it back to the founders, um, and the, the magazine actually first sort of um, hit the public in, in 1971. Um, it had an opportunity to do a, a preview issue before, before the newsstand issue uh, that we're looking at um, was released. But um, the way I think about the country then and, and the feminist movement, um, I, I think of two words. I, they're both righteous. I think about anger um, and I think about optimism. Um, in, in 1972, there really was a groundswell of activism and, and political energy um, in the feminist movement in this country and, and among the founders of Ms. Uh, Gloria Steinem included, they, they had also just created the National Women's Political Caucus. There was a real um, push for political representation, for narrative storytelling, um, and Gloria Steinem even wrote in, in the early issue, not, the, not this one, but the one that came next, she wrote, 1972 is when things are gonna happen, or something along those lines. Um, and it's true, things were happening then. In 1972, Shirley, Chisholm, Ch Shirley Chisholm's historic run for the presidency, the first black woman on the, the ticket um, was, was a reality, it was happening in real time. The ERA passed, the Equal Rights Amendment passed the Senate, in 1972, people thought there was really a path to sort of a quick ratification. 
uh, shortly after the magazine was launched. In January 1973, the Supreme Court decided Roe versus Wade. Um, I mean, we'll talk a little bit later about where we're at now and whether that righteous anger and that optimism was was placed, well-placed, misplaced, but that was part of the, the national story. In terms of the magazine, um, you know, there were a lot of ways that, that um, feminism was sort of exploding into um, mainstream uh, discussions, um, whether it was political, whether it was through consciousness raising, whether it was through storytelling. The idea of a slick magazine was pretty novel. Um, mm -hmm. It would be competing with the likes of McCall's and Ladies Home Journal. This, mm -hmm. this wasn't this wasn't really the medium in through which people saw feminism, you know, being distributed to the masses. Um, the magazine sort of struggled with what representation would look like, what reflection would look like, what it would mean to fund a magazine like this, who, you know, all the different competing forces, whether it was financial, whether it was political, whether it was social, whether it was cultural, whether it was economic, whether it was racial, um, all of that was part of all of the early thinking about what it would mean to pull together and create a magazine like this. One of the things that, oh, the picture's not up anymore, but is fascinating when you look at the um, cover is that um, it says winter 1972 on it mm -hmm. because when the first magazine um, was released, they were so worried, the founders, that people weren't going to buy it and they didn't want sort of the, the egg on your face factor of it sitting, you know, faded on newsstands months later. It sold out in days. Uh, it sold out in days, but it said winter 72 so that it could carry through the spring. The cover, um, the cover is kind of an extraordinary story too, and I can't wait to hear Sumita's views and thoughts um, about that. But the founders, um, and this is described in the book, really thought that um, this, this, this vision of the every woman, somebody that everybody could see a piece of themselves in or relate to in some way, her eight arms, as you point out, they're carrying lots of things. Most of them have to do with doing household work, um, a little bit perhaps of public work, um, she's holding a mirror too, um, you might notice, which necessarily reflects what the pu you know what it meant to be public out in the world as a feminist, what people expected women to look like, act like, what that reflection was. There's a cat next to her feet too. I'm mm -hmm. not totally sure about the cat, <laughs> other than maybe feminists are deemed humorless <laughs> and with a lot of cats. I have cats, um, but um, and she's crying. There, she's she's apparently pregnant. Um, but the the image was absolutely intended to be unifying um, and something that many people would see themselves in. The story um, and the lead story of the magazine, The Housewife's Moment of Truth, um, if, if folks are don't necessarily know that 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 title or that headline, you might have just heard the phrase click. I always snap my fingers when I say click. Literally that moment of recognition that you are living in an unfair, unequal world. And that was what that piece was um, intended to, to, um, to reflect. Um, it's actually a pretty radical piece too. There are a series of, of um, admonitions at the end of it to think radically, not accept no for an answer, things That's, like that. Yeah, and I mean, it, there's so much going on in that image and in that, um, in that, first, that first issue and you've just sketched out the history of that so clearly for us, Jen. But I'm wondering, Samhita, if what you have to say uh, about the cover that we were just describing. Um, so we invited you here to talk about Hindi cinema and the way that gender has been portrayed in movies coming out of India um, since the mid 20th century. But we've got to start with your take on that cover. Um, tell us what you make of that imagery of Kali on the cover of the first Ms. magazine. Yes, thank you so much for inviting me to talk about this incredible cover because I think it gets at something that is important for setting the landscape of this mid-century and particularly kind of long 1960s moment, which is the focus of much of my research. Um, so what you will see in this cover um, is these sort of bright colors, um, the figure of the Hindu goddess Kali, um, which is very reminiscent of a certain global visual culture and even youth culture of the 1960s. Um, and if you think about particularly a US context, much of that turn towards whether like images of the East or even 
um, the kind of psychedelic movement um, was very much tied to this counterculture that was entangled in student protests, anti-war movements. Um, and of course, there's you know, a flattening of, of, of Kali in terms of perhaps um, in some ways naturalizing that to a quintessential Indian message or, or, or deity or figure. Um, though in the case of a country like India, um, one must also remember that um, it's not, and we see the more the stakes of this now um, in the, and we can talk about this more if we have time. But how um, India is also not reducible to only say uh, Hinduism. Right. That it's an extremely like multi-ethnic, multilingual, multi-religious context. So that that flattening is also very important to understand in some ways when you're thinking about. Um, you know, what gets represented as India, both within India and outside. Um, the other thing that this image recalls to us is um, this Cold War moment when the world order really felt up in the air, that there's so many possibilities and disillusionment. So it's this really interesting time to also think about the intersection between popular media and popular politics. Mm -hmm. So it's this decade of so many movements, including in post-colonial or recently independent nations like India, um, sort of lots of um, foment on, you know, what does democracy look like or what how c what shape can this new nation take? And I'll finally just end by saying that to me, my interest in cinema, which just a second ago, Siva was sort of facetiously characterizing as a dying art. <laughs> this is <laughs> to be debated, but <laughs> certainly in this period, in many places in the world, um, there was no television. This mm -hmm. is hard for us to even mm -hmm. imagine. So in that context, again, of the Cold War, there's a way in which cinema takes a certain primacy as a, uh, a as a medium that was thought of as very powerful, whether for well modernization, influence, etc. That's so. Let's talk a little bit about the Cold War. This context of the Cold War. I mean, this this defines the moment when Ms. is really. Um, emerging. It defines the moment that you're talking about um, here today as well, Samhita. Um, what else, I mean, what else would you say, um, you know, one of the things that's so interesting and recognizable to a lot of Americans now is Bollywood, right? We, we've, so you've told us a little bit about the origins of Indian cinema in the 50s and the 60s. Um, Bollywood becomes recognizable in the United States much later, in the 90s. Um, but you say that its influence and popularity really begins in the mid-20th century, um, and that from the beginning it's really inscribed with feminine images and values. So taking up this thread of, um, you know, this thread that begins with us talking about Ms. Magazine, with talking about uh, the women's movement in the United States, but also the way that the women's movement becomes a global, a global phenomenon. Much, m you know, later, uh, later, you know, in the 70s and the 80s, it becomes more of a global phenomenon. Um, what did this look like in India? Who was watching the movies? What, it, what is, what is this um, inscription of feminine images and values that you describe? Yeah. So the woman question, as sometimes it's, it's, it's termed is a key question in many contexts, and particularly, again, in sort of newly independent nations. I'll come back mm -hmm. to that in a second. Um, but one thing that in some ways occasioned um, the writing of my book that came out last year was this curious way in which Bollywood, which was a name that increasingly became the name attached to Hindi language mm -hmm. popular films mm -hmm. in the 90s, um, was often described as gl going global in that moment. Mm -hmm. um, though, in fact, that's the moment when these films become sort of visible and increasingly popular in the West. Um, but in fact, there's a much longer history of Hindi films, incredibly prolific global circulation. So again, in this kind of mid-century onwards moment through the 60s, 70s, even into the 80s, in some cases to the present day, these films were so popular 
not only uh, across India, where there are many other language film industries and audiences, but also outside of India in the Middle East, in many parts of Africa and Central Asia, um, throughout Eastern Europe and the USSR. Um, so th also thinking about what do we mean when we say something is global or uh, a world history and shifting that to think about the world and world cinema from another orientation. Um, one of the other fascinating things uh, is often in the 50s, 60s, um, there's a certain idealization, like in any kind of popular industry, uh, of certain um, patterns of idealing, idealizing certain kinds of masculinity or femininity. Um, and there's a lot to say about this that can't only be reduced to this, but a very important thing is to remember that one must to be critical when that idealization is limited to a certain type of body or certain type of woman or man. So in Hindi cinema, this might have been in the case of certain films like Hindu, middle class, upper caste, um, conventionally feminine in certain ways. So to always read with even films that seem to have like very feminist or liberatory politics to also keep in mind again, what patterns do we see and to not take them for granted. So to always be sort of questioning um, what is implied by say these idealizations. Um, finally, the other thing I'll say is popular Hindi films sort of ended up in this period being equated to the singing, dancing figure as mm -hmm. feminine figure as the kind of primary attraction. And this led to a lot of debate, both on the one hand sort of outrage over um, sort of what some characterized as just like titillation and mm -hmm. objectification that was a vulgar representation of Indian culture, so-called to um, you know, valorizations of like, this is a kind of liberated woman who's working in movies and performing. And the, the, I think the precise account of that takes into account like all of these contradictions and kind of contextualizes them. Um, but on, on that note, I have a fun clip for you. So um, I'll ask Roberto to first play a clip from Chintuji, which is a 2000s film that in some ways is an homage to this earlier period. So um, uh, you'll watch the clip and then I'll say a little bit more about that. Thank you. So this is a, uh, you know, very generically tribal sequence, evokes some elements of a Pocahontas-like scene. Um, within the film, it's a film shoot within the film where the chief is played by Rishi Kapoor, a major film star who plays himself as a third generation film star. And the film is in a way both a parody and an homage to uh, popular Hindi cinema in the world. Um, did anyone catch the lyrics out of curiosity? So the, what the chieftain was uttering, and this is the joke in the film, is he says, Tarantino, Vittorio, oh. Mizaguchi, <laughs> Capola, and then the chorus of the song is Akira, Kurosawa, Vittorio, Desika, Weiler, Hitchcock, why that goes on and on. Um, but the how do you understand a sequence like this? What is the point? Well, one is it's a parody and homage to uh, mostly this kind of mid-century moment where you have the emergence of an auteur or director-driven art cinema as world cinema. Um, but the kind of joke here is you have like 
uh, an attractive woman dancing and that whole masculine canon of world cinema gets reduced to tribal gibberish. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but that's in some ways simplistic in the sense that in actuality, uh, the film is actually an homage to the invocation of um, Rishi Kapoor's father, the late Raj Kapoor, who was a huge star, again, in these other parts of the world, like Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union, Middle East, etc., cetera, um, to basically say that Hindi cinema and world cinema as art cinema, so-called, were both so engaged in the world, and there are things to love about like all of this, despite right. the historical polemics between them as they especially unfolded around debates over women's sexuality and performing women. Well, and this is fascinating because at this very moment, right, uh, that we have been discussing the, the, the late Cold War period, um, as Ms. Magazine becomes an important voice on this continent, uh, I, uh, what we see is uh, is uh, uh, almost uh, uh, subversive images flowing through popular media in ways that can't be spoken overtly, or or there's a hesitancy to speak it overtly in the same way that Ms. Magazine is doing here. So, Jen, can you talk about the work that Ms. did in the 70s? How did Ms. change the agenda, the political agenda, the social agenda, the sense of what is possible for women in America? Yeah, it, it's such. A, it's actually such a neat connector because mm. the words that you just said, you know, sort of the the bridge between, you know, an homage and a parody and the celebration or or rejection of of, of women's sexuality, like all of those conflicts, I think, are part of what it means to produce feminist media writ large, especially 50 years ago. Um, and from the person, and you know, it's funny because I will say, Ms. was was funny. There was actually a sense of humor to it. And, and if you pick up the book, you'll see there. There's a. It's it's not all just you know. I'm going to talk about some deep things too. But there's a lot of, you know, sort of self reflection that is funny in it. One of one of my favorite feminists are funny. Feminists <laughs> are funny. There's there's actually a cover that 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 had a comic, you know, questioning that that premise. But one of the funnier lines actually is just the title of Ms. is, is a word um, that was not part of the vernacular. Um, it, took, it took more than 15 years from the time that Ms. Magazine was published for the New York Times, otherwise paper of record, to use the word Ms. And Gloria Steinem would often joke that she was referred to in the Times as Miss Steinem from Ms. Magazine. Um, <laughs> but that, that, that you know the the idea of creating vernacular, of creating images. You know the the first cover is an iconic cover, but they went there were more and more. I mean the art and what people would see when they would see that magazine. You know on the newsstand that they would walk by was game changing, and so too was the reporting. Part of part of the reason I think the reporting was and continues to be so impactful is that it's not just regular beat journalists who are doing the writing for Ms. It was advocates. It it was people in the field. It was activists. Um, it was, and continues to be to this day. It was scholars. Um, it was teenagers. Um, it was people really from all stripes telling these stories. But a, a few of the ones I think that jump out, um, and especially in putting together, um, you know, curating all the the thousands and thousands of articles and images and photographs from over the decades for this book were in the 70s. Um, two really important issues that were that were not part of everyday reporting or the vocabulary that we had were around domestic violence um, and around sexual harassment in the workplace. Uh, so those are two issues that had um, really striking covers, uh, a woman with a black eye or full face when we're, you know, again, accustomed to seeing Vogue magazine and, or Seventeen magazine or whatever was on the newsstands then of the, the, the harshness of those kinds of covers. But again, it wasn't just the cover, it was the reporting, it was the storytelling. Um, there was a real prescience there. A lot of the um, issues and ideas that were covered in the 70s and, and through the decades um, are, are now things that maybe we take for granted are talked about um, nationally and globally uh, throughout the reproductive justice movement, the, right. the women's movements, gender justice, all of those sort of discussions. In the 80s, um, Ms. through polling that it did um, on college campuses about sexual assault, um, came up with the phrase date rape. That just mm -hmm. wasn't something that was understood mm -hmm. that rape could happen 
in multiple ways. Mm -hmm. um, so it was it, it it's a, it's a very unique brand of journalism because it is both sort of being on the ground with the story, it is telling the story, it is creating fodder for advocates to to create political and public change, um, and then continuing to report on that change. So it's sort of like it's full full cycle um, yeah. journalism, but we and we call it movement journalism. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not it's not mainstream journalism. That's it's right. not. Um, it does something very different than what the mainstream media does. It did that then, and it does that still today. Yeah. So one of the things that you are reminding us of and calling us to pay attention to is the fact that, I mean, Ms. does, Ms. historically and still today does a lot of work um, in the realm of advocacy, of destigmatization. Um, you also work in the realm of advocacy and destigmatization. De so I want to ask you, I want to ask you about your own work now, Jen. You personally have been on a mission to destigmatize periods, menstrual periods. You've written about why six-week bans on abortion are not really six-week bans um, because of how menstrual cycles work. Um, can you, you know, take up take up the um, take up the charge right now to educate us on this particular point um, through your own research and your writing? Why do you and your colleagues at Ms. argue that abortion is essential to democracy? I am so glad that this question is being asked. So yes, I, I am um, among the, the hats that I wear, including at Ms., including at um, NYU, where I also work. Um, I'm a menstrual advocate, um, and I've been involved in this work for about a decade. Um, and it takes a lot of forms, and, and we can talk about this in all kinds of contexts. Largely, my work and my writing have been focused on both destigmatizing menstruation and making it a matter of public policy. So thinking about the ways that it, this menstruation has been absent from our public policy, and that includes everything from um, a, a phrase people probably know now, the tampon tax, mm -hmm. also wasn't something that folks were super fluent in even a decade ago, and in other ways to utilize um, public leadership, public budgets, for ensuring that access to menstrual products, menstrual education, information um, is, is I intrinsic in our society. So that's a big piece of the work that I've been doing. And that's actually what brought me to Ms. It was one of the places where I started writing um, about these this policy agenda. The piece that you mentioned um, around the six-week ban, um, I was actually so thrilled that Ms. was the home for that. So um, in doing this work around menstrual advocacy, um, it has it has given me a front row seat to talk to legislators, members of Congress, state legislators who are increasingly important in in the the battles that we now face um, about periods. And guess what? You'd be shocked to learn that they didn't know a whole lot. Um, largely, I was in rooms with men um, who, if they weren't too embarrassed to talk about the topic of you know that we were there to um, you know have testimony on or otherwise discuss, um, you know, they would betray some of the ignorance, the fact that these weren't conversations that they that they had so or, or on a regular basis or with other people. Um, so around this this piece that you talk about around the six week bans, I wrote in September of 2021. And what was happening in the country in September of 2021 was that the Supreme Court was teed up to hear the case Dobbs versus Women's Jackson Women's Health Organization later that fall. It was going to be in December, um, and that's the case that folks surely know was decided in June of 2022 that overturned Roe versus Wade. Um, but before the Dobbs ruling, I mean, before the Dobbs arguments, the state of Texas had actually passed and an, uh, a law called SB8 mm -hmm. that um, was sort of a, a, a it's a complex, convoluted piece of legislation, but basically created civil penalties for people who would help other people to obtain an abortion. And with that law going into effect, as it did in September of 2021, it basically, for all intents and purposes, made abortion inaccessible and unavailable um, in, in one of the largest states in this country that houses 10% of the population in this country. Um, but what happened when that law went into effect, that really sort of um, hit me like a ton of bricks was when Governor Abbott held a press conference 
um, and stood on the, the state, you know, the steps of the state house and announced to the people of Texas that there was nothing to worry about. This law was not extreme because it was a six week ban and that meant you had six weeks to get an abortion. And I thought, oh my goodness, he either doesn't know anything about how our bodies work or he doesn't care. Um, he was either, you know, trying to, to mislead people or lying. It probably doesn't matter which it is. Um, but what really alarmed me was that probably the vast majority of people, when they think about what a six-week ban means, don't really stop and think about it from, you know, a quote-unquote menstrual literacy perspective. And so here's the headline. When a person discovers they're pregnant, um, they the way pregnancy is counted, that would be, at best, four sure. weeks from their last menstrual period, which mean, which is from the way that pregnancy is counted, um, so that the first day you find out you're pregnant, you are four weeks pregnant already. So you have two weeks to get an abortion, not six. Mm -hmm. um, and two weeks is, you know, another whole story about the kinds of, um, you know, delays and 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 issues that are created by the kinds of laws we see passed that require notifications and travel time and things like that. Um, in any event, so I wrote a piece about that. I actually had the um, good fortune to visit the White House. If you can imagine, I got to go to the White House to talk about periods with the Vice President of the United States. And, and, and I went in there with menstrual literacy as my charge. Mm -hmm. Happy to talk about abortion and democracy too, right. unless we want to pivot back to that later in the conversation. Right. Well, so well. destigmatizing taboo subjects is something that both of you have written about and thought a lot about. Um, and of course, Samita is also a Texan, so I'm sure she's already thinking <laughs> big thoughts about Texas uh, as well. So let's let's talk about that process of destigmatizing taboo. Where whereas in the 1970s in the United States, you could have an institution like Ms. addressing taboos directly, and it's not like that work is anywhere near done. Uh, because obviously we're still trying to confront taboos, destigmatize taboos, bring the unstated into the stated, the uh, the those things that that people refuse to see and discuss uh, into the light. Um, Samita, my childhood, part of which was in India, uh, showed me a complete absence of unwillingness to discuss things like menstruation, things like abortion. They just were not part of the conversation. They were not anything that um, moved beyond what women whispered about in corners of the house. And in the United States, it wasn't much better, despite having you know, overt outlets like Ms. Magazine. How did popular media in India at the time subversively reveal the presence of taboos and destigmatize them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, it, it gets at this question of, you know, what does a feminist politic look like in the world? Um, and, you know, to answer this question, again, 1960s Hindi cinema is interesting because its legacy is often as the kind of bad decade, like a decade of indulgence that focused on, like, couples romancing each other and traipsing through picturesque locations, singing and dancing, that was completely out of touch with the on the ground realities. Like this is a decade of such economic strife, political agitation. It's a very volatile moment in India and in the world. Um, but to me, what's fascinating about this moment is the kind of homage to love as such an important and even in some ways, um, in many cases, kind of out of reach possibility. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about this. So um, filmmakers like, I'm going to show you a clip in a second, K.A. Abbas, who espoused very like left progressive politics, um, often with films that had very like working class protagonists, so uh, sort of cinema of the people in a ways. Um, but even these like very progressive films tended to have this plot hierarchy where the heroes would sort of um, sacrifice their romantic interests and leave them as sort of secondary to their work, to build the nation, to build their communities, et cetera. 
But one of the problems with this is that it reifies this hierarchy and set of associations between kind of work and in some ways certain types of activism as a sort of masculine domain of like important like political agitation where romance is sort of in the feminine domain, it's secondary, it's a personal thing rather than a public thing. But one of the really interesting things about this is um, and I argue that actually love in South Asia, and this is, I think, part of its like on-screen ubiquity in a way as the heart of the films, is so important as a place where you have these politics of um, sort of sometimes like reifying boundaries between castes, communities, ethnic groups, et, et cetera. So this homage to the importance of love in breaking down those boundaries where people should be able to love who they fall in love with if it's consensual um, becomes really important where it's films that have this outsized portrayal of this that was often out of joint with kind of everyday life. So I'll show you a clip this is a dream sequence from this fascinating Indo-Russian uh, co-production from 1957-58 that um, sort of portrays, um, and he asks very radically, why is the world organized this way? Because it's a dream sequence about him dreaming about being with his Indian love interest, but saying the organization of the world doesn't allow for their romance across their religious and national differences. So if you would like to play this. Теперь ты видишь, что такое снег. Это и есть неоглядная наша Русь. Он равнит тебе здесь. Да, Ширь, необъятный. До чего мне хотелось с тобой сюда приехать? Скажи, краса моя ненаглядная, ведь любишь меня, да? Скажи, любишь? Да, да, ты сам ты знаешь. Эта любовь чиста, как воды Ганга, как эти снега. Она не умрет никогда. Голубка моя, а? невеста моя, бери Господь. Будь женой моей. Нет, невозможно это. И родина у нас не одна. И люди мы разные веры. Я не буду твоей женой. Милый мой. Любовь это счастье. Но мы никогда, никогда не сможем быть вместе никогда. Господи, где ж правда твоя? Почему так устроен мир? Давай я тебя на фильмах пропущу! So this has been, this conversation is so stimulating and wide ranging and what you were just saying, Samhita reminded me of Bell Hooks, um, the recently departed feminist um, writer and scholar because she argues, she has a lot to say about love. In fact, she has a book called All About All Love. love. Um, and she says that feminism is driven by what she calls like feminism when it's at its best and when it's most resilient and durable is driven by a love ethic. And so I'm thinking about um, I'm thinking about love. I'm thinking about feminism. I'm wondering um, if we can ask both of you. Maybe Jen, we can turn things back to you. Where um, you know we've been talking about we've been talking about film. We've been talking about print media. We've been talking about feminism. We've been talking about um, representation. Where um, what does feminism? Why does democracy need feminism? To your mind, oh my Jen. goodness, um, that's sort of the question. That's, that's that's really the actually question. the question of the moment. Um, I think that all of the all of the underpinnings of what we think about when we think about actually true democracy, when we think about justice, uh, when we think about lib both liberation and liberty, um, when we think about freedom, all words actually that have been that have been you know, sort of grabbed by by opposing forces too. Um, you know, freedom actually being very much a sort of like a, a right wing 
organizing frame. Um, but actually, when it comes down to it, our, our, the principles of democracy are, are inherent and are critical. And the systems of democracy are so at risk right now. And that's, I think that's fully intertwined, too. Um, this actually goes back to this, this series that we did, Abortion is Essential to Democracy, um, which was intended to show how the, the piecemeal and now what feels quite rapid degradations of our democracy, whether it's, and this is, I'm talking about sort of US democracy, whether it's vote suppression, whether it's lack of fair representation through gerrymandering, whether it's you know private interests and, and big money flooding our system, um, have created, have created a, a, a landscape that allows for and enables um, the, this, this regression um, so they're so they're so completely intertwined. And on the flip side, when we think about um, rising authoritarianism and white nationalism in this country, gender equity and gender justice it, it is is posed as the enemy to that. Um, so it's not just that our democratic systems are about actually supporting a feminist future, but it's that feminism is inherent to democracy, which is why the f there are such extraordinary oppositional forces to it right now. Uh, Samhita, some, some uh, India is the world's largest democracy. In the period you are writing about, most of your work, India elected a woman prime minister and did so long before most of the rest of the world made such a move. In fact, this country has yet to make such a move. How did that reflect upon this relationship between feminism and democracy in India? And is there an association in India between the, the status of women the dignity of women, and the health of democracy? Yeah, um, so I'll try to answer that. So facetiously, a mentor of mine used to say, there should be as many dumb women in power as there are <laughs> dumb men. Um, and uh, maybe someone else said that. I have no idea. Um, but why I say that is um, Indira Gandhi's legacy is one of a very draconian, authoritarian kind of dynastic leader. She was the daughter of the first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru. And in fact, um, three South Asian countries, at least, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and India, have all had um, women mm -hmm. as heads of state, unlike countries like ours. And, and Myanmar almost did, and yeah, then took her away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, but... So I can say a few things. One is that, yet, the idea of a feminine figure of the nation is not foreign, like if you think of Lady Liberty, say. But the problem with that iconography is that often it is reified, this idea of the motherland or mother as nation, to sort of privilege the sons of the nation. So often it's the mother who gives birth to sons that there's a certain imagination of a very, very male kind of fraternity that is naturalized to that idea of mother as nation. Um, the other thing kind of picking up Emily's question as well in terms of like why is feminism important to democracy? If the promise of democracy is this radical egalitarianism and a society of equality, then in many ways, um, feminism is about um, not only um, rejecting hierarchies that value, that devalue women, mm -hmm. so women's labor, um, women as, as equal humans, etc. cetera, um, but I think feminism more largely is about rejecting any hierarchies that put humans in a kind of continuum of value that values some and devalues others, whether that's about gendered valuations or devaluations or along other lines, race, class, caste, etc. Well, this has been a fantastic discussion. I would love to keep talking, um, but it's time for us now to take a few questions from our audience. Um, we've got uh, some time, so if you're 
for people in the audience to ask questions, but if you're watching online, you can also tweet us a question at DND Podcast. That's D I N D Podcast. Um, but let's um, let's see if we've got questions in the audience. Raise your hand. And we'll raise your mic. hand when you have the mic, um, please. And we're gonna. I think we'll start with this gentleman in the back, and then we'll come down to the front. When you have the mic, uh, please tell us your first name and where you're from. Hello, I'm Nathan. Um, I live nearby. I'm a student at UVA. Um, and I suppose my question, I don't think it was, the topic was quite covered. Well, thank you, by the way, also for, for this talk. Um, but I'm interested in Miss Magazine and maybe related um, publications on feminist portrayals of um, like mental disorders and particularly gendered ones and the stigma stigmatization around then, around that. Um, you know, the early 70s might be too early for this, but I know like in the late 70s and the 80s, um, particularly anorexia became much more in the media and talked about, particularly on McCarran Carpenter's case. So I'm just interested if in that um, publication there was um, rethinkings or reimaginings or, or Given different understandings about m those types of afflictions and mental disorders, particularly as they are gendered, um, particularly with eating disorders, because it's the most obviously gendered one, at least that I can think of. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, thank Jen, you. Jen, do yeah, you it's such an interesting yeah. question. Thank you for thank you for raising that. I mean, I, I'm it, it's interesting because in the book, um, I, I don't actually think that eating disorders in particular make an appearance in the book. But there is nothing Ms. hasn't tackled over fifty years, um, and and I think that um, you know to some extent certain pieces would be products of their time and and i would actually say that there is there is a, a, a in in the process of reading back through the old issues and creating this book it, it was it, it, there there was a real prescience at at that moment and i don't say that with any sort of you know self self connection to that that i i was not part of part of the the editorial team in in the 70s and the 80s um, I think that um, one of the issues that Ms tackled early on in a way in ways that have surprised me that relate to gender and sort of and that kind of public presence are not eating disorders but gender um, gender is a spectrum gender and identity um, there's a piece in the one of the earliest issues um, I don't remember if it was like you know 72, 73, but in the in the early times, and it's called um, the story of X, and I don't know mm -hmm. if this is yeah. one that you're familiar with as well by someone named Lois Gould, um, and it's about um, parents who are choosing to raise their child with the with the name X, not Twitter X, but just the <laughs> name X, um, and without sort of any of the without any identity as of, of their gender, and everything from you know toys to the, the child is small. I don't know that they ever say the child's age, but I'm going to guess by the things the child does that they're probably around five years old. Um, and everything from the way they dress, um, the way they view their body, um, the way they view their just their physical presence in the world, their emotional presence in the world, um, is not known to anybody but the child's parents and, and perhaps the child's, there's like an advisor or a doctor that works with the family. And that piece, um, all, I, I read it actually as a kid, um, and it always blows my mind still to this day that there was such sort of um, generosity and um, and and it, it was provocative, but sort of gentle. Um, so I don't think I'm answering your question specifically about anorexia or or body image as it was portrayed over the years. And I'd be happy to sort of return to the the files and look up those pieces too and see how they were. But there there are other issues that either are more contentious today or fell out in in more polarizing ways mm -hmm. over the decades and shifted from the 80s to the 90s when you know sort of that that I, I think of the 80s as, as a time when that kind of body image was was overly celebrated um, and how the magazine sort of shifted with the people that were featured on the cover with the 
people who told the stories mm -hmm. um, with the advocacy that it generated. So it's sort of a general answer because I can't really answer it specifically to the body image piece. But when I think about the story of X, that piece actually is the one that draws me in. We have copies of the book here. So mm -hmm. if people have, have a recognition of that or a click or whatever it is that they want to take a look at, I'm very happy to share it. Um, so I hope that at least gets to part of your question. Mm -hmm. Sir, you want to give us your first name and where you're from? equality in for political power for over 50 years. And I'm going to as a man, I'm going to say something that may be a little bit theoretical. And um, I think that in some ways, women might actually make better political leaders than men. Might. <laughs> and um, so, like to um, that. Um, so I want um, uh, your comments that I think that in some ways, that I think they might actually make um, be uh, better uh, government leaders. And so um, I'd like to hear what your opinions are on that uh, topic. I assume you mean from each of us, so mm -hmm. um, I'm glad to jump in, but we'll <laughs> jump in first and we're ready to go. Both of you on <laughs> yeah, as I started to say, I guess my implication was that um, it is important to not discriminate against the possibility of women holding office or being elected or having political power at the same time as I think a real feminist politics should instead should value that but perhaps even more importantly again what kind of feminist politics do they bring to office so again to take the example of Indira Gandhi um, many think that the biggest lost opportunity for this huge democracy was actually when she in 1975 suspended the constitution and declared an emergency to where um, a political moment of crisis was sort of dealt with brutally by sort of force and a clamp down on dissent instead of having been given a political process to work through that dissent and that in some ways the um, what we see now in India in terms of like a Hindu nationalist, more right wing politics has been a reaction to the authoritarian and dynastic politics that she represented. So neither is feminist in any sense. Um, so I think that on the one hand, yes, we should be electing women leaders and the gap in terms of like men who hold office and people of other genders is one to address, but so is the kind of content of their um, their 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 politics. Very good. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would second that wholeheartedly. Um, and, you know, it's interesting it, what, when in 1972 and among the founders of Ms. were the creators of the National Women's Political Caucus and the gender equity in political representation and in participation in the franchise were a key goal. Mm -hmm. um, and we've made, we've actually made great strides since then. I mean, the world looked a lot different in 1972 in terms of women's engagement in the public sector, in the, in politics, um, in, in representation and political leadership. Um, and, and I do think that is a positive advance. I do think as well that the, the sort of politics of feminism lends itself to better progressive outcomes and better politics. Um, and I think that many of the ways that, the, that women are socially conditioned um, in, in, in the kinds of values or the kinds of attributes um, would also lend themselves to better leadership if we had the imagination to look at leadership differently. Mm -hmm. So all of that can be true at the same time. Um, and and all what can also be true at the same time are that there can be women leaders who don't who don't reflect that, who don't espouse that, who don't who don't bring that to to the body politic. Um, so, th I mean, that's the answer. The answer yeah. is it's not simple. Right. Um, and the answer is we've yet to perfect the experiment. So um, we don't have we don't have proof either way. Um, 
if you asked me if if my instinct is to want to support more women in leadership, the answer is 100% yes. Um, but I don't necessarily think that's the panacea. I think though that is the the path. Right. Yeah. Well, that's it. Yeah. We have one more question from our audience. Uh, is it Wait, on? Is the microphone on? Um, my oh, sorry, Brian. Sorry. <laughs> Could you say um, your first name too? Sorry, my name is Courtney. Um, thank you so much for this talk. This was really exciting to see this um, during the day when we're talking about democracy. But my my question is about um, what you were talking about abortion as, I guess, being. Uh, necessary to the feminist movement. Um, it just it seems like there's been so much change since the earliest, you know, beginnings of feminism in in this country, and um, a lot of debate over certain topics and in fighting about you know racism or LGBTQ issues. And I guess my question is, um, I'm curious about why or how abortion has come to be so central to feminism. Why it makes us free, why it makes us liberated. Um, and sorry, just a little background, I guess, because I've been, I found some compelling arguments from like pro-life feminists and the language Samita was using about the continuum of value um, for human beings is the same language that people on the right will use when they're talking about abortion. They're not talking about, you know, the continuum of a human, whether it's in the womb or outside of the womb. So. Um, why, yeah, why is abortion so central and necessary for women to be equal? Thanks. I don't, I don't know which of that's, that's directed to, but I'm happy to, to yeah. jump in there too. So, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's, a <laughs> it's an extensive large debate and I will answer this probably with, you know, sort of shorter clips and I'm very, very happy to continue the conversation too. Um, I think that bodily autonomy is part of um, liberation um, and that continuum, uh, I, I wish we had a more nuanced society where those kinds of conversations can take place, but unfortunately we actually live in deeply polarized times. Um, but I think where, where I would at least land as sort of a central principle is the ab ability to make those decisions for oneself um, and the ability and the freedom to make those decisions for oneself is paramount um, to live in an equal society. Um, so that's sort of the quickest answer that I will give to that right here and now. Um, and very, very happy to have a more extended conversation about it, knowing that we, we live obviously with, we all are guided by different principles and different truths. Um, but the, the ability to make those decisions for oneself is, is central. Um, but where that sort of falls in with democracy, um, there it, it kind of is two sides of a coin, right? On the democracy piece of it, um, what we experienced actually um, with the Dobbs decision were so many breakdowns in our democracy um, that let everything from what, how state legislatures look right now and who's in leadership and who are making those decisions to what the, um, you know, to who sits on the Supreme Court, all of that is, is has direct connections to the troubled state of our democracy right now. Um, and the idea that we had a democratic outcome um, through the lead up to Dobbs and the decision itself is also, I think, a very, very crucial conversation to have about representation um, in our society. So that that's part of at least where I see their connection. Um, so hopefully that was sufficient answer for that question, which is a very big and bold question. I appreciate it. Thank you. Should we go to one more question? So one more question from our audience, please. And could you please say your first name? Um, hello, I'm from, I'm Hetvi. I'm from India and a student at UVA. Um, I didn't know this talk was going to like touch upon those things, but I was just wondering, um, I've not seen a lot of the 60s, 70s Bollywood movies, but I have grown up on, the 90s and early 2000s uh, movies. And I I feel like the 60s when Jaya Bhadri was in the cinema and things like that, uh, she or the characters that they portrayed, the women they portrayed had like uh, some sort of three dimensionality, which I think uh, we don't see very often in the 90s movies. And I know you're drawing like parallels between like uh, the government and what the cinema is trying to portray. And I'm wondering what changed or what shifted for 
um, the 90s popular movies to be um, kind of like one directional in that sense? That's a tough question because there is so much variation in terms of, again, um, like some films did have extremely archetypal characters in the 60s as well as in the 90s. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking about your question. I mean, there is a lot of change in the 90s, certainly. Um, this is the moment where, um, again, uh, it's sort of the globalized moment where the film industry is given official industry status, which prior to the 90s had never been the case in the case of Hindi cinema, despite its its popularity in the world. Um, another big change that you see definitely from the 50s um, is that while this earlier moment often tended to have like very working class sort of everyday protagonists, men and women, um, that has shifted a lot where increasingly you have on the one hand the content of the film featuring very different types of, for example, extremely elite um, heroes or heroines in some cases, but also the segmentation of audiences in terms of viewing practices, whereas in an earlier period, these films would be sort of everything for everyone. Um, now, in sort of single screen theaters or whatever, now you have sort of like very high end air conditioned theaters versus, um, you know, smaller single screen theater in say poorer neighborhoods. So that segmentation also reflects certain segmentation of um, films themselves. Um, so there are a lot of shifts here. Again, in terms of like, maybe one of the things is also like, if you were to like continue to watch, I think at a distance, like things that maybe women in the 60s would have been outraged by seem refreshing because they just seem different. So the ruts that they're stuck in, in terms of, um, problematic gendered patterns are just different from the ruts in, say, the 90s onwards. Um, but thank you for that question. I will continue to think about it. Well, Jennifer Weiss-Wolf, Samhita Sunya, thank you so much for joining us on Democracy in Danger. Thank you so much for having thank us. Thank you. Thank you. So we are going to run to our back announce and also our credits, but we wanted to give you a chance to move on to another session now that we've had your applause, which was really valuable. Thank you. Uh, if you want to move on to another session, we'll give you a moment um, so you can exit and and uh, and we won't have to use that part of the recording. Oh, yeah. We might do some pickups with some more questions and content. If um, you'd like to stay for that, feel free. If not, and now's a good time to leave. And hang out and check out and the book. Yeah, I was going to say, oh, the other thing, it's really important afterwards. that, yeah, there's a reception. And you can buy 50 Years of Ms. and look through it right out here, right now. Unfortunately, we don't have Sirens of Modernity. It is open <laughs> access, though, so you can get it So there you go. You get it for free. Um, okay. So check out, f check out 50 Years All of right. Ms. as well. So we're just going to wait for the sound to go down. Okay. Um, did you guys want to do a couple of questions that we skipped over? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> I think we packed the questions together. Like we, I think we, no, unless no, no, you no, did, no, I'm no, sorry. good, but I'm just I saying we had a couple we'll of that. questions that Great we didn't stuff. hit. Well, Emily That's might have a, a, a thought that I don't have. Um, all my thoughts are your thoughts, Steven. No, no, no. Yeah, I'm joking. Do you want to do Steve, the I'm left always joking. Question? Yeah, I did. I did. I mean, so why don't I? Um, sorry, I'm going into the text to look at it here. Um, okay. Well, I'll tell you, I'm I'm interested in one thing um, that we didn't quite do uh, in the in the the reading of the Cully cover, right? Because and I mi this may not end up yielding something. Um, worth using, but I'm, I'm always struck by the notion that, uh, I mean, Cully is violent. Cully, yes. do Cully doesn't depend on men. Cully punishes okay, men. Okay, so hang on. Let's do that Wait. question, and maybe Jen can talk about the second slide. Um, I can, yeah. Oh, second, okay, okay. Can so can I set this up? Can I set this up? Yeah. Okay. 
So in, in the spring of 1972, in the very first issue of Ms., we see a domestic cully, a domestic cully who is uh, also stepping into the world of work. She is frying an egg and typing on a typewriter. Now, by 2021, of course, there'd be no typewriter because we don't use typewriters anymore, but we have a little girl using a computer, and we have Cully using a computer, and we have a similar arrangement of domestic and professional obligations. In both cases, the Cully figure is not at war, but at work, right? And so this is not really Cully. The, the, uh, the number of arms is essentially the, the, the through line between the, the myth of Cully and this image. So for, for, for Samita, what, what do you make of this? It, uh, how Cully is this Cully? <laughs> That's hard to answer. I mean, again, I think there's been a long history of Hindu deities among other icons, being highly malleable and shifting over time. Um, Especially when taken out of context yeah, and I used in a... Absolutely. <laughs> and even like Hindu practices encompass such a wide range. Um, but one of the things that I think is really interesting about your question is it invites us to also think about how there's not easily a kind of one-to-one -one ratio between the figurations of deities we worship and um, our society. So for example, um, Krishna is often a Hindu deity that's depicted as dark skinned, but that doesn't mean that that value translates um, socially or that, you know, um, uh, Christians who worship um, a very kind of self-sacrificing God adopt that as, you know, part of their persona as one of kind of deep vulnerability. Maybe some do, mm -hmm. but I think that there's always a slipperiness between, um, you know, the, the rendering of icons as having these sort of extraordinary characteristics, whether it's the Kali who needs no men and is all powerful um, or, you know, other examples of this. Siva, could you give us just a line that introduces the oh topic. Oh, yeah, sorry, because I did that earlier. Yeah. yeah. Right, okay. So, so the, yeah, like, I yeah. could do that, yeah. So, uh, let's see. Samitha, uh, the Kali figure in Hindu mythology is... No, 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 that's not what I meant, sorry. Uh -huh. I meant we, we're when you introduced the topic of the magazine cover, right. we don't know that we're talking about two different years. Oh, so right. Um, I thought I said spring of 2021. And it's winter 20. But it's something winter like, let's talk about right? this cover that so came spring. out. Sorry. It, it we going from spring of se 1972. Oh, right. It was called spring. It's confusing. It was to 2021. Was yeah. So we just need that oh, line. Okay. Winter, okay. Actually so the if we look around. at two covers from this, starting in spring 1972 and then springing forward to spring of 2021, we see uh, an echo of the original, the ver very first cover of Ms. with a different Kali figure in 2021. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then. I don't know. Uh, originally, we had thought about asking Jen about like what's going on in the country at this time. I don't oh. know if you want to follow up with that, yeah. Emily. Yeah. yeah. So, um, what's going on in 1972? Yeah. No, so like what's going on in 2021? We need 21. Yeah, and why the cover? Like why the harkening back to the cover, and then why was it different? Why the nation's moment of truth? Right. Okay. I'm looking at our notes. Sorry. We hold on. Give me one second. 21 was the nation's yeah. mo moment of truth, don't we? That's all too seared in our memory, but yeah, that's a good question. Oh yeah, you're right. Um, I was thinking about what the question, how to word it. Uh, so, so the question is about contextualizing what's going on now in the United States. Well, well in twenty one. What's the, the oh of the context? Okay, yeah. all right. Why this cover that? Got it. Okay, so. Jen, why the return to the Kali figure on the cover of Ms. Magazine in 2021? What was going on in the country um, that's driving that that return to the imagery? I think I think we can all very uh, traumatized in traumatized ways reflect what was going mm -hmm. on in 2021. We were a year into the pandemic, um, and the plight of work and particular particularly women and working mothers. Um, was profound, um, and the, in the picture, instead of a cat, 
instead of a cat at her feet, although there is actually a cat at her feet too, scratching at her. Um, there's a child working on Zoom school, basically. Um, and it was a reflection of, I think, the moment of crisis that our, that our country, and, and truthfully, globally, um, we saw women in particular in as primary caregivers, as workers, um, and what the, um, what, what the, what the, the depth of carrying that balance looked like. It's interesting because you had said, is Kali a figure of war or work here? And I would say both in some ways, right? We, it, there, there was a sense that there was, um, it, the, the crisis was that deep. It wasn't just sort of the, you know, business as usual, what is gender equity, what are gender balance look like in this country? But women bore that so heavily um, in, in ways that Congress was willing to take up um, in, will, in ways that the mainstream media was sort of having the conversation, but to to sort of revisit it as a moment of of crisis, a moment of what does what could the future look like? Um, I think we're both in the minds of the editors when choosing that cover. Women left the workforce in tremendous numbers during the pandemic, um, and and there was a lot of news coverage at the time about how women were bearing the brunt of of the pandemic by leaving by leaving the workforce, right? Right, and what the future was gonna look like yeah. on, on account of by that. By leaving the official workforce. Mm -hmm. by, le by leaving the official, by, by leaving paid labor, right. Jen, maybe we could get you on tape just uh, saying what the headline says, so we have that contrast. Uh, in a s just give us a sentence yeah, about okay. the headline. So the headline on the 2021 issue is, Do We Care? The Nation's Moment of Truth. Which is, which is absolutely intended to be uh, a riff in many ways on care and what care looks like. Do we care as a nation what, what caregiving looks like? And the nation's moment of truth, um, the reflection back to the housewife's moment of truth from 1972. And it's not an accident that this figure is portrayed as an African American woman, is it? I mean, what's that? Can you say a little bit about what, what you think might be going on there? Yeah, it was reflect. I mean, the the original the original story of the 1972 cover was to be an every woman, um, and to think that there would be an every woman reaction um, or connection. Whereas in 2021, it was to point to the very very uh, deep and problematic reality of what was happening in this country, in particular for the most marginalized women. Um, so and we need you telling because I can't be in the show. So you d can you say something about it being the the how because we haven't heard yet okay. on the show that it's what 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 the care the what the crisis was in twenty twenty one or what the oh the sorry the sorry the description of, of the figure American. yeah so um so it is a black the cover is looks like the the Kali cover um, other than we see now a black woman dressed in um, home clothing um, I think we all became sort of comfortable with working at least in sweatpants during the pandemic. Um, and she is minding, she's carrying a baby, she is carrying a mask, she is carrying a syringe, she's carrying workplace items, she is carrying house, household items. Um, there is a mess at her feet. There are boxes, delivery boxes. There's a tipped over plant. There's a child working on her computer. Um, there's groceries. Remember wiping down groceries when they were delivered to our homes? Um, it's basically the entire chaotic nightmare that was that period of time during the pandemic, which interestingly now in 2023 even looks a little bit, you know, like something in the rear view mirror and I'm feeling a little traumatized saying all of these things out loud. Um, but those were certainly the reality for, for women, for working mothers um, in 2021. That's great, that's great. Aren't you feeling a little like kind of like heart pounding at remembering yes. wiping down groceries and things? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. More so about many the Zoom stories. Schooling that's getting me worked up. Yeah, yeah. it's because I was on the other side of the Zoom conversation. Um, is that good for pickups? Should we go to back announce? Yeah, yeah let's All do right. it. Yeah, sorry, I'm I'm scrolling. I'm, I'm okay. Here we go. Jennifer Weiss Wolf is the author of Periods Gone Public. She was the inaugural Women in Democracy Fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice. She is now Director of Strategy at Ms. Magazine, and she is at NYU Read. I missed the, the circle there. The wording. 
Are you faculty in NYU? Uh, NYU in the NYU. I lead the Women's Leadership Center. Okay. At NYU What's law. the name of NYU Law Form? Is it NYU, say NYU School law of Law? NYU School okay. of Law. Okay. Right. Jennifer Weisswolf is the author of Periods Gone Public. She was the inaugural Women in Democracy Fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice. She's director of strategy at Ms. Magazine, and she's now at NYU Law. You can read some of her work in the magazine's new retrospective, 50 Years of Ms. Samita Sunya is an associate professor of cinema at the University of Virginia. She studies film history, media circulation, and gender dynamics across cultures. You should check out her first book from the University of California Press. It's called Sirens of Modernity. And now we go to credits. Well, that is all for this live episode of Democracy in Danger. In a couple of weeks, we'll bring you the story of a tenacious activist from Belarus. So all of us were sentenced to 12 years of imprisonment, and all of us are supposed to be deprived of citizenship. Stay in touch in the meantime. We're on Instagram and on what formerly was known as Twitter, at DND Podcast. That's D I N D Podcast. Or leave a comment on our webpage, dindanger.org. Find links to what we're reading, great images, and more about our guests. None of this would be possible without our wonderful team. Democracy in Danger is produced by Robert Armengol, Nicholas Scott, and Stephen Betts. Ariana Aronson edits our social media. Adine Yeager engineers the show, which, with help, from Ellie Salvatierra, our interns are Charlie Burns, Lena Frehat, Katie Pyle, Makhdoum Morad Shah, and Caroline Yu. Special thanks this time to all of the staff at Lighthouse Studio and to our friends at the podcast Village Squarecast. Support comes from the University of Virginia's College. Support comes from the University of Virginia's College of Arts and Sciences. We are a project of UVA's Karsh Institute of Democracy. And we're part of the Democracy Group Podcast Network. The show is distributed by the Virginia Audio Collective of WTJU Radio right here in Charlottesville. I'm Emily Burrell. And I'm Siva Vadianathan. Until next time. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Oh, Thank you both. All right. We have a reception now. Please come join us, chat with our guests.